Hello, and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the International Centre for Sustainable Carbon. My name is Rebecca Cameron, and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, www.sustainable-carbon.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration on the website. Please feel free to type in any questions in the question box as we go along, and we will try to answer them at the end of the webinar. The subject of today's webinar is Global Coal Reserves, How Much Is There Really? by Graham Chapman. Over to you, Graham. Thank you very much, and um, welcome to everybody, um, wherever you are. I'll just move down to the title page here um, and just give you a little bit of background on what we're going to talk about. Um, essentially, we'll explain in shortly what the difference between reserves and resources is and what we mean by a reserve, but and how they are defined um, by the people that uh, undertake the have the expertise to undertake these sort of um, processes. Um, we'll look a little bit at the way that different countries treat their definition of reserves and uh, to see if they're in fact comparable and then provide a summary towards the end of the, some of the major coal producing countries really based on the concept of there's always been a, 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 a perception that there is a significant coal resource and reserves in the world and in fact some people claim there are hundreds of years of potential production available and the thrust of the conversation that we're going to have today really revolves around whether that seems to be a logical um, uh, premise or whether in fact there, with their, there may be um, other factors which will impact the long-term reserve base and whether that may, would mean uh, some implications for customers. So most oil reserves are defined really into resources and reserves and I always think it's a little bit of a a shame in some ways that the, the, the words are relatively similar and because it does I think tend to lend people towards um, interchangeable using the terms interchangeably when, when they are really quite different the, the, and the primary differences are quite important to understand so when we're dealing with resources and the diagram on the uh, on the right uh, really is taken from Jork which will explain I'll explain in a minute what that means but that's the most widely used classification system um, the, the primary difference is that resources, which have three categories of increasing confidence, um, don't have economic factors applied to them. It is They are deemed to be likely to be economically extractable, but they haven't had a feasibility study or a basically a mine plan associated with them, which will define whether the economics uh, makes sense for the exploitation of that particular resource. And then the reserves, of which are normally two categories, in Jork there were two categories, um, these are where the resource, the reserve, well, the resource has had economic factors applied to it, usually to the measured and indicated resources, and so they've been upgraded to reserves. So, in other words, when we're talking about reserves, we're talking about um, uh, the part of the coal deposit that can be extracted under sort of sensible economic conditions, as opposed to a resource which is really more likely to be. Um, the coal will almost certainly be there, but it's unsure whether it can be produced economically or not. Uh, and all of this work is undertaken, it's very important that this work is undertaken by a competent person who is somebody who's de uh, defined as having five years worth of, sorry, relevant experience. So if we look at the systems around the world, um, they really fall into three broad categories of classifications. Um, JORC, as you can see at the bottom of the slide there, is, is an um, acronym for the uh, Joint Ore Reserves Committee. Uh, and really this whole process grew out of um, a period of boom and bust that occurred in the Australia mining industry uh, during the 1960s uh, and led to the formation of first of all the committee and then eventually in 1989 uh, the first code which was meant to act as a guide so that investors could have some sort of um, confidence in, the, in what was being reported and uh, potentially companies that were listing on the stock market and, and seeking investors. So essentially JORG is pretty much the foundation of the systems that we have and there are a number of other systems which follow very closely to it but are named differently. So in South Africa there is the, the SAMREC in Indonesia has its own code but essentially they're very similar to the JORG system. In Canada there is 
Um, what is quite widely used in Canada and in North America quite widely is the uh, 43101 system, which again is linked to the Canadian stock market. And then we have the Russian Chinese system, the Chinese system deriving largely out of the Russian system. Um, but even here, <coughs> excuse me, we'll see that the Jork um, system becomes far more uh, applicable. And I, I've personally spent the last five years working in Russia. And even their Russian financial institutions, even though they would have to, they would recognize the need to follow the Russian classification system in order to get the mining permits, they would still require a JORC um, a, um, a classification um, before they would seek international funding. So essentially, most of these resources and reserve systems have two or three categories of reserves and are usually about three or four category resources. So there's a broad amount of uh, comparability. However, the one area which is quite difficult to really get under the skin of and really understand is that the economic criteria, which bearing in mind we have to have a feasibility study to complete a reserve estimate, the economic criteria are relatively rarely reported. And that does make some challenges, or it creates some challenges when we're coming to uh, look at the comparables. Um, these systems tend to fall within two broad categories of um, which I won't dwell on because I think it's, it's it, but the, the, the diagram just shows you that the most of the coal producing companies form under a, a, a the Crisco international system. The idea being to try and create some sort of um, compatibility between different countries. It does require a competent person to produce a report, but it is an advisory um, code as opposed to, for example, JORC, which is a requirement of a listing process. And then there is also a, a much wider scoped uh, UN framework classification, which um, can include a number of different types of, of, of classifications. Um, so they, they, um, then the, the, that's a 3D system. It's a little bit complicated. So, but the, the bottom line is that we have a number of classifications around the world, but they're all there is a, a reasonable. Whoops, sorry, reasonable degree of compatibility between them. Uh, and this diagram here just goes some way toward indicating that it, to all intents and purposes, a resource is something whereby we have increasing confidence uh, through a, a number of different uh, processes that will increase the um, data that's associated with it. And then when we move into the reserve category, that really does indicate that there is the economic criteria there for that, resort, that reserve to be uh, actually exploited. So in terms of how we define a reserve, um, there are a series of steps that we do need to go through, and they're quite important that these are followed um, so that we can begin to understand what, it, what is meant by a reserve and, and what the implications of defining a reserve are. The first stage is really very much around completing a geological database, which really is all the geological information in coal that tends to revolve around uh, drilling. Uh, there are other methodologies, but drilling is one of the primary um, methods that we use to obtain the necessary quality information and inform general information around the coal deposit. This will then feed into mining models. These can be short, long, short in some mines they might only be a, a, a day plan or a, a, a weekly plan or they can go right through to a life of mine plan. Um, and that will also, if it's a non-operating mine, constitute a feasibility study, so which is obviously the key element in defining a reserve. And part of what needs to be in any one of these studies to lead towards this definition is the, um, the, 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 the understanding of the costs of the, associated with the mining, with the processing, obviously the transportation to the market, uh, the, the loading if it's going out through a port and the, the whole uh, labor and fuel costs, uh, basically the whole package of, all, of what the different costs elements will be to come to a sensible conclusion. So clearly, to define a reserve, it needs to be that the production costs are less than the selling price. I mean, it's pretty, I realize that's pretty basic, but it is quite important that it's, a reserve does need to show that economic viability for, for it to be classified as such. Um, when we come to looking at the balancing act, if you like, between costs and prices, um, it's general that, when you have a, a competent person who barely remember has the necessary experience to um, undertake this uh, assessment in the first place, 
generally speaking, the cost of production is, is reasonably well known. You're, you might have, if you're if associated with a mining activity, some historic costs, or there may be other mining activities in the area, which will give you some um, understanding of what's uh, what the production costs are likely to be. And th there's also internationally available, generally speaking, a wide range of benchmark costs the way you can compare different types of mining. So production costs themselves generally um, are work quite well known, but pricing itself can be much harder, especially if we're dealing with the export market, which is typically subjected to a number of uh, short-term events such as weather or strikes and we're seeing that in the current thermal coal market at the moment where the price has gone from about $60 a ton on an FOB basis in other words loaded at a ship into a ship uh, to about $160 primarily on the back of political tension between China and Australia that China is not taking Australian coal that's placed more pressure on other uh, suppliers um, so uh, it would be you know, the, defining what the price is uh, the, uh, going forward is quite um, a challenging business. It's more so than the cost defi definition, which tends to be a little bit clearer. Um, and uh, I, I should just say, I think for when we're looking at prices, there is a long term, I believe there's a long term likelihood that prices will typically stay at about $75 to $80 or $85 on the export market. Uh, domestic markets are a little bit different um, but so we are seeing a spike at the moment and it would be important to take a long-term view of that because um, we know that prices trend quite or, or in the last 15 to 20 years have really um, been much more volatile than they were for the previous 30 to 40 years where there was a fairly tight trading range between about $20 and $35 it's got much more dramatic than that as the market has changed and so I think a long-term view is, is quite important. Um, and although we go through the, there are a number of resource uh, statements that we can use when we're trying to define um, these key elements in, in how we take the whole thing forward, um, the sources are still not always as um, comparable as we would like. The, the BP statistical review is generally widely quoted as being one of the most um, important and uh, is often used as a basis of country by country assessments. Um, but in fact, in, in many cases, if you look, particularly if you're looking into uh, individual company data or in some cases country data, some will will include, uh, for example, marketing marketable result, uh, reserves, which are in the coal business mean that, that is uh, coal that has been subject to the washing process and there will be a yield factor applied to it. Some may include proven and probable reserves, some may only include reserves, some may include a life of mine assessment and the coal quality associated with it, some will not, uh, dependent on the production rate. Uh, some of these estimates are undertaken by independent experts, others use in-house. In so there is quite a wide variety and so when we mix these things together, especially with the basic economic assumptions, especially on the coal pricing, it is quite important to take quite a a view of them and as I said before one of the issues is that we don't really have um, often uh, uh, been party to the key economic data that's assumed because that's often quite sensitive and many companies don't want to produce it so you may they would not want to reveal their cost of production or even the price assumptions that they're using so it does mean though that comparing um, one set of reserve figures with another set of reserve figures it's difficult to know whether the same basis is being used or not so in looking at where reserves may stand and how much coal might be available um, looking going forward it's obviously useful to try and work out how much coal is likely to be used particularly over the over the future decades um, and this report, uh, which will be available uh, in, a, in a few weeks, I think, um, will, is not intended to be in any way a review of, of coal demand going forward. That's a, that itself is a whole um, um, independent you know, assessment that's required to be done. But the view, I think, very much is there is now, in, in modern uh, assessments, there is pretty much a, a major um, variety of scenarios and most um, of the well-known um, producers of um, for any any sort of energy forecasting will, will use a quite a wide variety of, um, um, of scenarios predicting what will happen going forward uh, and some of these you know will include uh, some of these will include 
widespread use of coal and some of them will not and they can be quite um, can be quite wide ranging in their conclusions so I think for the for the purpose of this report <clears throat> and for the general belief that the, that the coal demand will stay relatively static until around 2040 with a probable decline thereafter I fully I expect that that's not something that everybody would uh, would concur with but I think it's a logical conclusion when we're trying to assess whether the coal resources and reserves will stand up and I, I think it fits in with the with, with what we've seen in the in the lower diagram where the there appears to be a, a fairly um, stable coal demand scenario uh, from the last eight to ten years and it would fit in with the idea of a, a relatively stable picture going forward and as I mentioned earlier um, I think having a, most long-term predictions will suggest a an export price which is a very much the, the one half of the definition of the reserves um, as being somewhere between 75 to 80 dollars or somewhere between 70 to 80 dollars I think will be where will people typically look at these sort of valuations now um, it's interesting when we look at the global coal reserves and this is really not uh, not digging into um, the, the details of it right now this is simply taking the view that is is what is produced in this report and this um, set of numbers comes from the um, the BP statistical review uh, now I should mention that the um, the coal industry didn't really um, um, I suppose you might say bother itself with with the reserve to production ratios much until about 15 or 20 years ago that this was a, a feature of the oil and gas industry much more where it is much more of a crucial factor in the long term long term sustainability uh, of a company's performance in coal I think there was always a, a fairly general opinion um, that there was very adequate resources of coal available so therefore the RP ratio wasn't particularly um, wasn't particularly necessary but I think as time has gone on JORC has become a much more important um, system in terms of companies publishing especially listed companies publishing uh, what the situation is with their reserves um, it is uh, more interesting to see where some of these ratios sit and I think the key um, message from this particular uh, study is that the the uh, the RP ratio for the Middle East and Africa really reflects um, a, a very limited resource base outside South Africa and for Asia Pacific which is the um, major uh, obviously the the focus of where coal use is likely to be over the next uh, 20 to 30 years it's actually a surprisingly relatively low number it still is in excess on these numbers of over 50 50 years um, and we have to caveat slightly on exactly how these reserve figures are calculated but it does show a very significant um, uh, lower figure than is attributed to the other main areas and obviously some of these areas like Europe will probably not utilize those resources that are there so if we start to have a look at the main producers of um, of and exporters of coal uh, this is obviously a very high level look at where they might sit in terms of their long-term ability to supply coal um, and to, to certainly feed the export market which will because many of the users of coal in, in Southeast Asia which as I mentioned is going to be a big focus for the long-term use of coal will, re will rely on the export market uh, it is I think quite important to to have a feel for where the main exporters may sit um, so I think it's always appropriate to probably start with Australia because it's probably the country that has the most plentiful resource base there are extensive um, coal resources really all the way up through uh, from New South Wales through into the into Queensland and Queensland is by far and away the world's biggest supplier of coking coal and I should mention that I don't think any of the resource figures and reserve and resource figures that are, that are published uh, usually differentiate between coking coal and thermal coal and the most like the BP review do differentiate between uh, lignite and, and subbituminous and part of the reason for that is it is quite difficult to um, understand the, the, there's a sliding scale between coking coal and thermal coal it's not always easy to, to, to define an exact cutoff of what is coking and then uh, the secondary definition of, of metallurgical so without wishing to confuse it uh, Queensland is a very important producer for coking coal thermal coal tends to be a secondary uh, producer for most of the major mines um, but the all of the coal that has essentially come out of the um, out of the Queensland areas come out of the Bowen Basin which is shown in the diagram 
and in New South Wales, most of the production has come out of the Hunter Valley. Uh, there are some secondary deposits. Uh, there's Gunner, another coal field called Gunner to the north and some um, older working areas uh, down towards the coastline, but essentially the Hunter Valley remains a focus. And what we're seeing here is that there is a long-term um, potential. The resource base and reserve base of, is, is around 80 billion tonnes, um, which is going to supply well over 40 years worth, uh, at least in theory. However, very few mines have started up in the last five to eight years in Queensland. I'm only aware of one significant mine that's come onto the market, and that was really a brownfields sort of extension to an existing operation. Um, and similarly, there, are, there is no immediate plans in New South Wales for new mines coming on stream. And it's actually quite telling that at the moment, uh, BHP, and this is as much a political issue as anything else, but BHP is trying to sell its major thermal coal producer in the Hunter Valley at a price of minus 275 Austral million Australian dollars. So in other words, it's trying to find people that will take over the mine and, and, and give them money. So the, the, there are, there are a very, there's a very limited picture and, of new mines being started. And we've certainly seen with the development of the Carmichael resource by Adani, which is in the, um, in the Galilee Basin, which is the next basin over. It's the first time that a coal mine will be developed outside the Bowen Basin in Australia. Um, and that's a relatively lower quality mine. It requires a great deal of new infrastructure to be built and um, could potentially have sig significantly higher costs. So it's being watched quite carefully as an indication of what the true picture will be with these coal basins, these alternative coal basins going forward. But I think in general for Australia, there is, it will require more logistics. It will require um, the, the companies to, I think, act in a way which will um, deal with the fact that environmental pressures are growing. Um, and there, there is, an, uh, I think, a suggestion that new operations will tend to be higher cost, mainly due to the uh, location. But essentially, we're, we're unlikely to see a major reserve uh, restriction in place on Australia. If we look in Russia, um, which is a major producer of, of export, well, of coal itself and of export coal itself uh, as well, uh, again, a very large resource base. The challenges here will really be the fact that the coal is situated just about as centrally in the country as it could possibly be in southern Siberia. Mainly, the most of the export coal certainly uh, around a um, uh, an area known as a Kuzbas, um, which is the, the primary source. So the coal is railed um, up to 5,000 kilometers, both to the east and traditionally to the west, although that's, as the market in Europe declines, that is becoming less and less. And so Russia has committed, or the government has said it intends to, I'm not sure that's the same thing, but anyway, um, uh, to double, effectively double production up beyond 400 million tons or so of, of, of export coal. But significant new infrastructure will be required to move the coal, as we would assume that nearly all of that coal will be moving to the east. Um, that will be, um, so, so a great deal of infrastructure is required to allow that to happen both at rail level and at port level. And Russia is, as you would expect, with a, such an enormous rail distances, uh, extremely sensitive to rail the actual costs of rail, which currently run at about just under $30 a tonne, typically, depending on the location of the mine. Um, so all in all, Russia do, does not have a reserve issue. Having said that, it's worth just noting that um, the, the mines are tending to go into deeper seams, more complex geology and more complex mining, which will push costs up. But provided Russia can keep its overall costs, I would say, under $60 a tonne, it's not going to see any great restriction on its reserve basis. Um, I'll just deal with Colombia and Indonesia relatively quickly. Colombia is, is a... The, the challenges for Colombia will, will really revolve around its geography. It's difficult for... Uh, the, the traditional market for Colombian coal has been into the, to the North America and Europe. Clearly, those are markets which will probably decline in time. Um, and it's not very well positioned geographically to try and move coal into Asia, although it has done so historically, so it's not impossible that it can do so. Uh, most of the mines in the country lie in the north, and they are quite uh, large-scale operations that are showing signs of, of, of reserve depletion in, in the sense that their qualities are declining slightly, uh, but it's, it's not thought likely that the reserves will be a, a limiting factor 
uh, and probably more associated with market conditions. And similarly for Indonesia, although well, Indonesia is the largest exporter of coal in the world and in theory has a reserves that are usually quoted at around 40 billion tons or just under, but some figures actually, you know, not always substantiated, but do come up with significantly larger figures. The challenges for Indonesia are the fact that um, any coal deposits, the, the very few logistics uh, still exist in most of the mining areas which are in East and South Kalimantan. Uh, most of the coal, and there are very significant resources certainly in Sumatra, is very difficult to assume would ever be mined with the almost complete lack of infrastructure in the country. So, and the, and the, the second part of that is really whether the, the typical low CV, relatively high moisture coal, albeit low in ash and sulfur, will continue to find a market as, as we move forward and um, power stations perhaps adopt more higher um, higher efficiency uh, uh, methodologies, uh, whether that whether the traditional role of Indonesia as a blend coal, uh, given its very low cost, because many of these low CV coals are selling under typical circumstances at thirty dollars or so, uh, whether that will be um, still viable in the future. So the reserves again remain reasonably good in Indonesia. But there will be challenges with developing them because even transporting coal over relatively short distances compared to other countries because of the lack of infrastructure means that a, a, a coal resource which is 100 kilometers for argument's sake uh, from another, <coughs> another area um, can still render it uneconomic. Um, I, and I, I'll just touch on the US briefly because I think very much in the US, the US has very extensive resources and reserves. It has very uh, significant amount of exploration that's been done over the years. Much of its resource base lies with the, again, like Indonesia, with, its sub, with the sub-bituminous coals of the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. And it is true that there is a more limited reserve base on the eastern, traditional higher quality eastern coal fields where many of the thin seam mines have operated. Um, and some of the potential expansion areas into places like Alaska seem to be meeting environmental challenges that will suggest it's not likely to um, happen uh, anytime soon. So um, with also a traditional market of Europe uh, forming a challenge, it's difficult. It, it would seem uh, it will be easy to assume that the more of the political and, and uh, environmental uh, policy making going forward in, in the States is going to be a primary driver. Um, Canada is a second, I suppose, after Australia is a primary source for coking coal, with most of it emanating from British Columbia and Alberta. As you can see from the graph, Canada seems pretty committed to phasing out the use of coal in the country, um, particularly uh, over the next decade or so, and there appear to be no planned increases in production, certainly by the major coal producer. And recent environmental permitting challenges for some planned new mines, uh, including one called Grassy Mountain, which was owned by Gina Reinhardt's company, does uh, suggest that it's going to get more and more challenging um, for the coal deposits in Alberta and British Columbia to, to reach um, fruition in terms of actually pr production. So although the resource reserve base is reasonably um, robust, it would seem likely that it will be more uh, dealing with the environmental issues that will be the primary um, the primary issue. So turning our attention to, to, to the final two countries are where we do see potential challenges going forward in terms of the supply side. Um, South Africa's reserve base is actually quite limited to about 10 billion tonnes. Um, and the reality is that I, I went to South Africa, unfortunately, many years ago now, but uh, as a young geologist, when the Whitbank coal field was really just in its expansion phase, it's now very much coming towards the end of its life. Most of the um, mines that operate in the country uh, do produce reports with estimated life of mines, and most of those are between five and ten years. Um, Eskom, the state utility, which has been a massive user of coal over the past, um, is, is also showing indications that it will move more and more to a renewable type of energy. The plan always was that the Whitbank coal field, as it declined, would, would be replaced by the Waterberg coal field, which is a, a very, which is a resource base of potentially up to 50 billion tonnes, but it's remote, um, it lacks water uh, supplies, um, and there's no rail infrastructure system, and it's highly unlikely that anything is going to be built in the, in the near term at what would be a very, very significant cost. So currently, I think it's likely that the um, 
approximately 75 million tons of export coal uh, that is currently being exported out of South Africa will begin to decline quite rapidly towards the end of this decade and then potentially very much so after that. So it is possible that other resources could be located, but it seems very much like a, a classic scenario of a of a large coal field which is coming towards the end of its natural operating life, even though actually some of the mine lives have been extended quite significantly in the past. And then finally, China. I mean, not easy to do China in one slide, um, and I, I wouldn't presume to try and give anybody a, a detailed assessment of, of China necessarily um, at this, in this such a short time. But it, the reality is that for many years, China actually produ uh, reported in reserves which indicated only 15 to 20 years worth of life. And that was re-rated two or three years ago uh, to around a doubling of that, to around 130 billion tons, obviously China being the most significant producer of coal in the world. Um, never been very clear as to why exactly that uh, re-rating happened, although uh, talking to people in the industry, um, there is a general perception that that was potentially due to the fact that um, you know, China just did, wanted to get away from this constant assumption that there was going to be a problem uh, with its long-term resources. And th the other thing is that much of China's reserve base is deep. Most coal mining in the world has not gone below a thousand meters. Uh, China has operations below, uh, well, 15 or 1600 meters, although doubtful uh, economics. So then again, that ref re reflects back on the validity of reserve statements. But the, it is definitely uh, clear to say that when we're dealing with deeper resources, they are more technically com complex and the production costs tend to rise. So I think a big question mark in my mind as to the true long-term resource base in China after some probably 15 to 20 years. And a lot will depend, I think, on the Chinese domestic market, the pricing that is, is, is allowed to be used, and also the technological ability to mine coal at considerably deeper depths than have been done in the past. Um, and just sort of finalizing, um, the, I just wanted to ask and answer the question, are there any new big coal deposits which will, could come through or countries that can come through as major suppliers in the way that Indonesia and Colombia typically did in the, in the 80s and 90s? And the answer in, in short terms is no, not really. There are several reasonably extensive coal deposits in, in, in Africa, but almost complete lack of infrastructure. Uh, and in some cases, uh, as, in, uh, as in Kenya, um, environmental, environmental opposition um, preventing uh, some exploration work going ahead. And in Asia, um, Mongolia has is developing a, a significant resource of about 8 billion tons at the Tavan Toigo field, but that will be uh, needs of, uh, increasing infrastructure, and it is increasing. The rail system is being put in place to move it into China. Uh, but there is very limited in potential anyway. So in other words, we don't see any real potential for a major new deposit to come through in the way that some of the other countries did. And so in summary, um, I think it's true to say that the world has got a significant coal reserve base. I certainly don't think it's in hundreds of years, um, I, but it is there and it will almost certainly um, be, probably without, with South Africa being the exception, able to continue to supply coal um, similar rates as what we're seeing today until around 2035 or 2040. Having said that, there is a very significant resource base, which if the economics makes sense, could be upgraded to reserves if they're required. So the challenges that we see, I think, are around South Africa and China. And then on top of that, I would really add in that the environmental uh, permitting systems and the, to some extent the financing that goes with that um, will become, I, said, I think, increasingly challenging for new mines to be developed. And it may well be that for a long-term user, especially for maybe a relatively new power station, because that's where nearly all of the coal tends to, tends to be used, um, I think for a long-term user, it may well want to reflect on the way that the supply agreements have typically been um, adopted in the past of relatively short-term contracts and perhaps reverting to something which actually was seen in South Africa many years ago on the um, for the Japanese steel mills when, when uh, the actual customers undertook due diligence exercises on the coal suppliers and then signed long-term agreements with a view to securing supply on a long-term basis. So um, I think, as I say, the overall conclusion is really that the, the, the 
there is, there is a significant reserve base. It's probably not as big as most people, as, as often has been reported over the years. Um, and there will be some areas where challenges will occur as, as we go forward. Um, so I, I can just give everybody a couple of minutes just to, if there are any questions. Um, one of the questions that's just come in is, is um, other about the coal reserves in Poland. In the report that we produced, we do cover that. I didn't include it in the in the presentation, but just simply because of the relatively limited time. Um, there are significant coal reserves in Poland, uh, or well, if I, I would say between resources and reserves. And I, I'm aware of uh, one major uh, exploration project which is underway, which would develop potentially develop a, a deep Cooking coal operation, and but it remains to be seen at the moment that's actually uh, undergoing uh, legal challenges um, between the government and the owners of that mine. So that's not clear, or that project, sorry, that's not clear whether that will develop develop um, going further. Um, and for the more traditional mining areas, at the moment it's very difficult because the a lot of the pricing associated with the coal sales in Poland tends to be uh, set by the government and that does provide uh, that does potentially create some sort of um, um, slightly false arrangement to, that may not be sustainable more on a political level so I think Poland is uh, pretty well committed to trying to keep its resources uh, its minds open till about 2045 my own personal view is that the reserves are there to deal with that at the, at the current rate which is about 60 million tons a year but I think the pressures, the there will be environmental pressures both on cleaning up the old areas because there are some very significant uh, residue deposits which need to be dealt with, um, and and expanding mines or you know bringing new mines into being when all the ones um, come through are uh, will be quite challenging for Poland. So I think the reserves are, are reasonable, but I, I I I'd be very surprised if Poland really continues as uh, producing at the rate it does uh, much. Into, next de into the next decade. And um, there's a question regarding uh, coal reserves in Mozambique. So Mozambique um, is a little bit challenging. Um, there is one, I'm sure most of you are aware, there is one uh, significant operation there which is currently owned by the South American company Vale um, called Moatiz. There are some in terms of reserves, the only reserves that would be in the country will really be associated with that current operation. Um, that to, to make it sustainable, um, it's in it's um, with its Japanese partner has put in a, a thousand kilometer rail system to a deep water port uh, and improve the port facilities and, and uh, all that goes with it because the um, nearby uh, port to the south was unsuitable. Um, there. It's difficult to see, but the, the fundamental problem with the coal in Mozambique is that there is only a yield on, it's normally washed in on a two-stage process, which means it's processed to separate good coal from bad coal. The good, some of the good coal is coking coal and good coking coal, but that only constitutes about 32 to 34% of the overall product. And um, then there's a secondary thermal product, but um, the logistics, uh, sorry, the economics are very, you know, defined around the, the, the yield on the coking coal. And uh, so far, that's the only mine that's developed uh, of any significance in the country. There are other coal deposits to the north of the Mertes Basin, but in terms of reserves and, and really exploitable reserves, it would, uh, they would appear to be restricted to, um, to the existing operation. And it's, it's difficult under the economic conditions to see whether that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, so the question regarding uh, whether new coal applications can come into the industry uh, regarding things like hydrogen production or graphene or other ways. I think that it's certainly possible that, that there can be other uh, uses uh, for coal that have not been um, developed now and that may include, for example, uh, the production of, of hydrogen. And it, I know that there are several companies that are looking at producing uh, graphene and possibly even synthetic graphite, which is used in battery anodes in, in cars um, and will potentially, well, in electric vehicles, sorry, 
uh, and will potentially grow uh, as the market does. However, the graphite market as a whole, which currently sits at about um, about a million tons a year for natural flake graphite and a, a little bit more for synthetic graphite, is probably earmarked to grow, and it could potentially get to 10 to 20 million tons, uh, you know, quite extensively, uh, or quite easily. Uh, but that's probably more than 10 years away to get to that sort of phase. And even then, it's it's not really going to make a major impact on overall coal demand. So I think there are some uh, now there are other technologies that are looking at uh, utilizing coal in a different way. And effectively, I, I'm aware of one company that's able to produce an almost pure carbon from from by a, a flotation system um, from coal itself, which does open up the door for other uses. Um, in terms of hydrogen, um, I'm not really well enough qualified, I suppose, to really answer, other than the fact that um, I think a lot will depend on how we handle emissions. I mean, I think one of the primary differences between blue hydrogen and green hydrogen at the moment where it's considered, well, or being considered to utilize blue hydrogen from, from, uh, um, from natural gas. And I, I was slightly amused, I have to admit, to when I read somewhere recently that it was suggested that, that the uh, CO2 produced would be uh, stored in um, old oil fields, which is something the coal industry has been trying to do for, for, many, for many, many years and hasn't found a, a really easy solution to that sort of problem. So I think that I think the capability is all there. Um, and I think the potential is there for there to be different uses for coal. Whether that will really impact, I, I think it's in, interesting to note, and this is a, a statistic I only came across recently, that coal is, is by far, we, we, we sometimes forget, I think, the order of magnitude by which coal, how big coal is in terms of its production globally. So at 8 billion tonnes, it's by far and away the, the, the biggest produced mineral. The next one down is iron ore, I think it's about 1.5 billion. And after that, you get about three minerals which are running at around two or 300 million tons. Potash, uh, can't remember the other two now. Um, but I think it brings into context how big the coal market is. Um, and so anything that is going to materially you know, impact that has to be in its own way very big itself. So I think there's real potential for coal to be doing, and a lot of companies are working on that, but I'm not sure it's going to really materially impact the coal market overall in the next uh, decade or so. Um, I think the final question, which is if, if how much coal is used for solar photovoltaic production. Um, to my knowledge, coal isn't used in solar photovoltaic production, I, it may be, I think it's, well, I'm sorry, I, I'll take that back a little bit. I know some specialized coals are used in the silica metal production process that, will, that is added into the photovoltaic. So there is some coal usage that I'm aware of. I haven't looked specifically uh, beyond that um, because I think the silica smelters require a fairly specialized type of coal, which I think emanates from Eastern America or possibly Colombia. Um, so as far as I know, it's a fairly limited market and it will probably amount, and I'm just honestly just guessing, uh, to a few million tons a year. Uh, it could get bigger, uh, but I think there's some very special criteria that need to be met that not many coals will meet. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, the report on this, on this topic will be published in the next few weeks. And the slides from this webinar will be available to download from the webinar page of our website very shortly. The next webinar from us will be on the 8th of September 2021 on economic and carbon emission assessment of coal and CCS power generation against other low carbon technologies and will be presented by Toby Lockwood. Thank you all for joining us today and goodbye.